Recording in progress. Inspiration is highly needed. It's important to take in consideration all aspects, including, we just heard it, the North Korean fears, and that nobody loses face. I don't believe one should be a winner and the other one should have lost the game. It's a question of finding a solution that both can be the winners. And during this time of the pandemic, we need health for peace and peace for health. The two laureates, Professor Dame Sarah Catherine Gilbert and Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, are the heroes who devoted themselves to health for peace. Champion Aram Together, with wisdom, sincerity, and resolve, I do believe we can illuminate the path to peace both on the Korean Peninsula and beyond. Breakthrough of peace on the Korean Peninsula would reflect globally. If peace will be the cornerstone of every nation and every generation, then the 38th parallel can become a symbol of peace rather than division. We are doing a great job making any effort to unify Korea, but uh, respecting human rights, uh, uh, having uh, uh, the sense of history that drives you to this uh, effort for unification. In this context, the Korean Peninsula could be the ground of an exemplary pathway to peace. I am sure that the Universal Peace Federation Summit will contribute to this important process of searching for constructive solutions to a conflict that has been going on for too long. The people of Kosovo and of South Korea share a similar past of suffering under occupation and of struggle for freedom. Freedom means and seeks peace.
the Korean Peninsula. And why is Africa important? Well, from a UPF perspective, there are many, many reasons why Africa is very important. First of all, Africa is a, a continent where 70%, no less than 70% of the population are under 20 years of age. It's a remarkable phenomenon. So it's an incredible opportunity to educate the future population of Africa if we can win the youth of, of uh, Africa for the principles of, of UPF. Fortunately, we are not only working there on our own uh, to do this, we have the cooperation of, uh, this is Prime Minister on the right, Brig, Brig, Brig Rafini, former Prime Minister of Niger, and who's now uh, Secretary General of Sensat, the organization that I was talking about, which is basically the middle of Africa upwards. It involves uh, the, the um, Mediterranean countries along the Mediterranean coast, Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, those countries but also countries down to as far as Central Africa. 25 countries, and as I said, the most, in, most uh, numerous number of nations in Africa of any organization except the African Union itself. And they are very interested in educating and training young people for the same reasons as us. And Brig Ruffini is a great devotee of UPF, I think it's fair to say. He believes very much in the principles of UPF. He's been working with UPF for three or four years now. And um, this was a signing ceremony. On the left is Dr. Yoon Young Ho, who's our uh, global uh, Secretary General for UPF, and uh, some other African ministers of education and youth and so on in the background. And um, so we've established this MOU by which we will be taking a great interest and in investing seriously in youth education. Why is youth education important in Africa more than anywhere else? It's because the, the opportunities for education are so much less than, say, in Western Europe. And um, also, youth is exposed to things like um, uh, terrorism in Nigeria. One of the big problems, Boko Haram, they are grabbing the youth and bringing them into the t their terrorist networks, and this is a similar phenomena are common throughout that whole region of Africa. And of course, young people don't have uh, great advantages of primary or secondary education, and uh, therefore they very easily fall prey to immorality of various promiscuity or drug abuse or any of these other things that can affect young people. So this MOU is a commitment on the part of UPF to really invest in the education of youth in Africa. And in fact, some of you may know that UPF in the UK already has a project uh, with Nigeria particularly to educate Nigerian youth. So we're doing it on many levels, but uh, this is fundamental to the growth of and the development of Africa in the future, to have a young generation coming up who are um, educated in the right way. Sorry. Now, the other, th the other great group of people who came from Africa was this group of 47 religious leaders. And the great majority of these 47 were not religious leaders that we've had before. Uh, in fact, the ones there mostly are Sheikh Mansour, Prophet Radebi, and Archbishop Ndanga. But the rest of them, the other 44 or whatever it was, they are uh, religious leaders who've come for the first time to any unification or UPF event in Africa or elsewhere. So we had to get to know them, but it was actually a great delight to do so because we found they were so open to the ideals that UPF espouses. So on the right, you have the, the new one of these four, Father Bazila Mbila. He was just uh, spoken to a few days before the conference. He didn't know us at all, but we were, vi we were working closely with the African Union. And while on a visit there, one of our key leaders in Africa, Kathy Rigney, uh, was able to talk to him and discovered he was actually the Catholic chaplain to the African Union. Invited him, he came, was profoundly moved, and uh, very much wants to work with us in the future. Um, another facet of this whole uh, summit was a fact-finding delegation from the United States, mostly, almost exclusively, um, visiting top leaders in Korea, top government ministers, the Minister of Defense, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, various other key people in the 
the South Korean government, to talk about prospects for Korean reunification, which was the other purpose of the, of the summit. And these two people are very key people from the past. One is Walter Sharp there was commander of the UN command, all the Republic of Korean and US forces in the, in the whole region on the whole peninsula for three years from 2008 to 2011. And Ambassador Harry Harris was the um, admiral of the, I forget which fleet America has in that region, but anyway, the American fleet in that region. And he was after that from 2018 was the ambassador of the United States to Korea. So both key people in linking uh, America and uh, uh, the Korean Peninsula. Another person was, this was at the time of the um, visit or leading up to the visit of uh, the speaker of the US Congress, um, Nancy Pelosi. And uh, Annette Liu was invited as representative of Taiwan. The delegation was led by Joe Detrani, who was uh, formerly on the, the American representative on the six party talks that involves uh, China, uh, Russia, and North Korea on the one hand, and South Korea, Japan, and the USA on the other. And he's a very famous person, very influential person. He's still very much involved in American uh, uh, government affairs but uh, he's also very closely connected to UPF, believes very much in the principles of UPF. And so he was leading this delegation and uh, the way that they were received was beyond all expectations from what I've heard of the reports. I wasn't involved in that side of things myself, but uh, there was nobody who wouldn't meet them. They also had some American congressmen, which was important. And um, their um, visit was uh, really outstandingly successful in building bridges with the South Korean regime, which was part of the purpose. Then other uh, delegates to the, uh, on the visit were Charlie Hurt, who's the opinion editor at the Washington Times, which is the uh, sister organization of UPF in the United States, and Chris Dolan, who's the president and executive editor of the paper. So a lot of reporting went back, as you can imagine, to the American uh, capital through the Washington Times. Then there was a session on religious freedom and one of the key uh, speakers there was Mike Pompeo, who I'm sure most of you have come across. He was CIA director from, I think, 2016 to 2017, and also Secretary of State under Donald Trump for almost four years. And um, anyway, the importance of Mike Pompeo is much more than the fact that he participated and supported the, in and supported the religious freedom uh, session. Uh, because he is somebody who's come to understand very deeply, more deeply than most people I know, the importance of the principles that UPF is trying to see established as part of the global uh, community. And he wears his heart on his sleeve. He's a Christian. Um, I don't know which denomination, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, he says, I never made a secret of the fact that being a strong believer of Christ followed me for all the challenges I faced ruffled some feathers in Washington, a Secretary of State, I kept an open Bible, open Bible on my desk, read it daily, it wasn't for show, as a leader it's vital to stay grounded in the truth. This commitment led me to truth, led me to believe that defending religious freedom should be a central focus of American foreign policy. And as you'll see, because I want to show you his actual presentation uh, to the uh, event on the 14th, celebrating the anniversary of Father Moon's uh, ascension, uh, he is someone who very deeply understands the work of UPF on the Korean Peninsula. So uh, I'll save explanation for later, but basically he went so far as to put his own involvement, which was meeting with Kim Jong-un, uh, preparing the way for Donald Trump's three, three meetings with Kim Jong-un uh, in Singapore, in uh, Phnom Penh, and where was the other one, Saigon? I forget where. Um, and. Um, he compared his own contributions being tiny, minuscule, compared to the contribution that Father and Mother Moon made in initiating their peace process on the Korean Peninsula. We're going to see that uh, testimony of his a little later on. Then others on the uh, session on religious freedom were 
the director of our sister organization, Japan on Legal Affairs, of Legal Affairs. And on the right was one of the victims of religious kidnapping, uh, one of our members in Japan who was kidnapped and held for 12 and a half years to try and break his faith in the unification uh, doctrines and failed. And he then went on to get the law changed effectively in Japan about religious freedom. So this sort of thing would be much more difficult in future. And um, it was relevant because uh, we currently have something of a problem in Japan. Some of you may have read about it. The Guardian had a piece a while ago. The Times had a big piece about a month ago. Um, and basically, our movement in Japan, UPF, but also Family Federation, Women's Federation, and others, are being, uh, they're trying to uh, basically prevent them from being active, to put it in a kind way. And uh, this is all to do with Japanese politics. It's also to do with the fact that for as long as we've been involved in Japan, uh, we have tried to explain the fallacies of communism, of, of materialistic, godless communism. And um, in that regard, um, we've come to have enemies in the Japanese communist movement and in the Chinese Communist Party and so on. So um, there are many things involved in the activities against us. But religious freedom seems to be the key to preventing those things from destroying our movement in Japan. So I'll explain a little bit more about that later on. But um, two other people were very key, and they are both Europeans. And this is sort of to explain how much Europe can actually contribute to protecting the situation in Japan. Uh, Massimo Intravenia is probably one of the handful of the most uh, renowned and capable sociologists of religion in the world. He's also a practicing lawyer in Italy. And he also has the largest single library of anywhere in the world, of any university or of any individual in his own home, dealing with uh, new religions. He is really the global expert on, on new religious movements. And the problem of religious freedom is most often found in relation to new religious movements. So his... Uh, contribution was very key to that session on religious freedom. The other person who was key, some of you may have been here a, a week or two ago, when, I forget how long ago it was, 4th of August, uh, three, three weeks ago or more, um, when Jan Fiegel was speaking here on this very platform. Jan Fiegel is one of the most renowned experts and uh, people have made a difference in terms of religious freedom around the world. He was the EU's special envoy for religious freedom outside of the EU from 2016 to 2019. And he's most famous, I'm sure most of you have heard of him in relation to the famous case of Asha Bibi. You've probably heard, you remember that one. It was a problem in Pakistan. This young Christian woman had been sentenced to death and imprisoned for seven years. And um, he basically was the one who engineered her uh, being able to get out of Pakistan and migrate to Canada and, and to safety. And so he is um, a very much renowned figure in this field around the world. And both of these gentlemen are helping us very much in Japan to explain to the Japanese government and whoever will listen that religious freedom dictates that we, as well as everyone else, should be able to have access to politicians. Religion shouldn't be barred from having any communication with politicians just because they're religious. And um, so then this led to the signing of a declaration on the universal value of religious freedom. In the picture there, you see those two gentlemen, but also others like uh, Newt Gingrich and uh, others from the United States who were at the conference. Then there was a performance of the Little Angels. Uh, always we like to have a, a strong cultural element in our, in our um, uh, events and um, that went down very well and then we had a symposium of various academic contributions about peaceful reunification of the Korean Peninsula. Um, why this is important is because a, a lot of people think that Korean reunification is just about politics and just about politicians meeting each other negotiating with each other reconciling <coughs> excuse me with each other but um, what UPF understands is that it's going to take a multi-dimensional approach, um, multidisciplinary approach, 
from diplomacy, from politics, from economics, from uh, the academic sciences, from uh, all kinds of different disciplines to come up with a solution that is workable on the Korean Peninsula, to find harmony and unity enough between North and South that they can agree uh, maybe gradually over a period of time to merge as, uh, and become one nation again. So uh, these people are all key people. Dr. Mansurov is one of the world's leading experts on Korea, originally Russian, then went to um, North Korea for, he was in North Korea for many years actually, and then went to the United States and is now a professor at Georgetown University. Dr. Kim Long is from this same institute that I mentioned, uh, founded by uh, Cambodia to help with reunification, together with UPF. Dr. Petrescu is uh, a leading expert from the Russian Academy of Sciences, which is the most prestigious academic body in Russia, on Korean reunification, but also on uh, all issues to do with uh, China and Northeast Asia. Dr. Cormont, Barthélemy Cormont, is a um, leading expert in a think tank in France. Thank you very much. Very needed. Thank you. And um, Dr. Cormont has worked with us also on this reunification process. Then Dr. William Lay is a, a legal, legal academic in the United States as well. So uh, then uh, Vladimir Petrovsky. Uh, again, and then from Albania, former deputy education minister and coordinator of International, uh, International Association of Academics for Peace, um, Samira Pino, and Martin Ramirez from Spain, who's also an expert on um, reunification on the Korean Peninsula. Three commentators, again, Dr. Cormo, we just saw, Sunida Messi, former deputy prime minister of Albania. We've met in the last year or so, and Nuno Andre, who's a leading young theologian in the Catholic Church. And then um, one of the highlights that I already mentioned was this focus on Africa. We had not only ministers of youth from the Sensad, the uh, northerly uh, nations of Africa, but also uh, Minister of Education from Niger, the Minister of Civic Education from Malawi, which of course is in the south of Africa. And um, then there was a um, very touching ceremony where the uh, University of Peace in Costa Rica, which is run by the United Nations, founded by the United Nations, and uh, regulated by the United Nations, uh, awarded both Father and Mother Moon, the co-founders of UPF, a very special honor of, a, of an honorary doctorate, which is very special for the reason that no person that we know of or they know of has ever been awarded it posthumously. So, of course, Father Moon passed away 10 years ago and he's only now getting his honorary doctorate, but I'm sure he's very happy about it. So, so that was a very, that was Mother Moon receiving her honorary doctorate and then a, a, a giving of gifts from the Middle East, from Lebanon to Mother Moon um, as part of the celebration on the 14th of uh, Father Moon's ascension. But what I wanted to focus on uh, most of all, because I think it illustrates the point that I made at the beginning very clearly, is this sense of the development of UPF. Because Mike Pompeo has not been involved with UPF for very long. He's not been out of government for the very long, for that matter. And, um, and yet, he's somebody who's discovered UPF quite recently in the last year or two. And he's come to understand it very deeply. Not least, as I mentioned, he's come to understand uh, the importance of UPF's initiative on the Korean Peninsula to unite North and South. And he was, of course, as I mentioned before, he, he was involved in the setting up the meetings between Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un. Uh, but as, of course, as Secretary of State, he handled the relationship between the um, United States and North Korea, the United States of South Korea, the United States and Japan, um, as well as, of course, China and Russia during that period, the, the other five parties to the six-party talks. And um, what is amazing is that he really understands and he's willing to declare very publicly, as you'll see in a moment, that what he did was a little bit of a sideshow. He doesn't use a, that exact word. but the visits of Donald Trump to those various capitals in Northeast Asia 
and the efforts of various um, American presidents over the years have been relatively minor compared to the peace initiative initiated by Father and Mother Moon when they went to North Korea in 1991, in December 1991. So, uh, Raymond, are you ready to show the video? I'd just like to let you listen to my point at Pompeo and then I'll give you a few comments to that afterwards as well. So. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for that most gracious welcome. Uh, distinguished world leaders, ladies and gentlemen, it is a true privilege to be with you here today. It's an honor to be part of this memorial program in honor of the life of Reverend Sung Young Moon and Dr. Hak Jan, uh, Jok, Jok Han Moon. Having had the chance to visit North Korea, to be there, and having met so many who lost their families and loved ones due to the Korean War and the 72 years of separation that follows, I know the unspeakable pain in the Korean people's hearts for those who lost their loved ones. I know the pain has been deep in the heart of Dr. Sun Myung Moon and his wife, Dr. Hak Cha Han Moon. Yet through that pain, hard work. They worked to reunite North and South Korea. This is a story of love and passion and a deep understanding about what makes people great. Reverend Moon, as you know, was born in North Korea. He grew up under Japan's occupation until America brought it to an end. After the Soviet-backed communists, led by Kim Il-sung, took over North Korea, Reverend Moon was arrested, imprisoned, and tortured, along with many others, including many other Christian pastors. He was sent to Hungnam, a North Korean communist death camp. During this time, Reverend Moon learned the critical flaws of communist ideology, the most fundamental of which is that denies the existence of our God and the value of every human life. Two things happened in that prison camp. First, first Reverend Moon survived because of his faith in a loving God. Second, he determined that he would vote his entire life to helping the world free itself and overcome communism. He saw, Reverend Moon saw, Reverend Moon saw clearly, he saw clearly why communism would always seek to destroy religion. It had to because faithful obedience to God leaves no room for submission to a totalitarian regime. He also knew that it's only God's love that can satisfy the human soul. And no man or government can make itself ruler over men and women who have been born free. War came here. It came to the peninsula. Thanks to General MacArthur and his soldiers and their landing at Inchon, you and coalition troops, many of which were American, a man, many of them like my father who served in the Navy during that war, they bombed Hung Nam, and the prisoners escaped from their hell. Reverend Moon did not flee, though. He went back to Pyongyang to gather church members who would go with him to the south. Even when he, even when he had finally found freedom, Reverend Moon continued to work every day to save others. He gathered those who could journey with him, and they headed south. He walked to the border, and he crossed it. In Seoul, he came back to found the Holy Spirit Association for the Unification of World Christianity. He called for the unity of all Christians and for each of us to love each other. He taught that Christianity through strong families and faith in the Lord must not oppose God denying, or must constantly oppose God denying communism. He then was blessed. The Lord blessed him. He married Dr. Hak Jam Han Moon in 1960, and the church continued to grow. Due to his experience with communism, he knew that Japan and Korea were critical to join America to stop the expansion of communism in Asia and indeed all around the world. This remains true today. He began by starting what became Victory Over Communism, activities to educate Japanese and Korean students 
that communism as an ideology was empty and barren of hope and of love. He offered a different view, one which affirms that God is the origin of all life, and he challenged the fallacies of communist ideologies everywhere. He worked tirelessly to stop communism. Reverend Moon also understood the importance of America and its place in fighting communism. He'd seen it when he was freed from that prison camp in the North, that America must be strong and it must be moral and it must be free and have a free press. He knew that America must be supported by those timeless pillars of freedom, of faith, and of family. I couldn't agree more. He, in 1982, Reverend Moon and Dr. Hakja Han Moon started the Washington Times. This year, we'll celebrate its 40th anniversary. That puts it at the same year I began my journey as a young cadet. That 40 years is a testament to the work and vision of Reverend Moon and Dr. Moon. This, this lovely story, this remarkable history, is where I would like to close today. This last remarkable story of Reverend Moon's life, North Korean dictator Kim Il-sung had sent assassins to kill Reverend and Dr. Moon in both South Korea and when they traveled to America. Undeterred by this danger, Reverend and Dr. Moon resolved that they would love their enemy no matter the potential personal cost to each of them. This was as they knew, as Christ had commanded his faithful to do many years ago on the shores of Galilee. In this spirit, they went to the north to meet with Kim Il-sung in 1991. They went with sincerity in their hearts, with a deep desire to help North Korea move towards freedom and to democracy. Many would have balked at such a mission. Many would have thought it too risky thinking that two people should not take that risk because the likelihood of them changing decades of division and tyranny was simply too great. But Reverend and Dr. Moon didn't go there as two people. No, they went there instead as humble servants of the Lord, called to spread his word in his name and in that place. In his preparation, In his preparation meeting with Chairman Kim's close advisors, Reverend Moon boldly proclaimed that Kim's Juche ideology wouldn't work, for it denied the existence of a living God who we all know and love. Many expected that the meeting would be canceled because they'd said that, because of their declarations of faith, and even feared that Reverend and Dr. Moon's delegation might well be arrested for having uttered their commitment to the Lord. Instead, instead a miracle occurred. Jeremy Kim welcomed them to the dinner, and they talked like distant relatives brought together after a long separation. Reverend and Dr. Moon broke bread with their persecutor, with their potential prosecutor, just as Christ had broken bread with sinners. This meeting, This meeting, this meeting marked the beginning of a long peace process of which I was privileged to be a small part during my time as America's Secretary of State. I'm thrilled to be here today. I am thrilled to be here today. I am humbled and thrilled to be here today because I know that one day we will see the Korean people united in freedom. Following Dr. Reverend, Following Reverend, Moon's, following Reverend Moon's passing, Dr. Hak Jahan Moon has continued this noble, great work that she and her husband had spent their lives engaged in. She embraces leaders who are with us today from all across the world, from the Middle East and from Asia, from Africa and Europe, and from the Americas as well, and from China and Russia, and from North Korea. We've seen over these last few days leaders leaders from everywhere joining her in her efforts to bring North and South Korea together peacefully. 
She has done magnificent work in expanding what she and her husband started. Bless you, madam. On this, on this Memorial Day, my wife Susan and I, we want to thank Reverend Sung Young Moon and Dr. Hak Jahan Moon for their work towards peace. And we pray for Dr. Moon's success in bringing North and South Korean together. It is the Lord's work. God bless all of you. And may we one day gather in peace together. Thank you. about the, the momentous quality of what Mike Pompeo was saying. Bear in mind that you know he's a past politician, but I think he's a man with a future. Who knows, he could be president of the United States. He could be, again, be um, uh, Secretary of State. There are many possibilities. If not next time, then the time afterwards. He's still only 57, 58 years of age. So he's somebody who carries now the principles of UPF, the heart of Father and Mother Moon, very much in his own heart. And to me, the remarkable thing is, a lot of politicians, if they felt like that, would keep very quiet about it because it's a bit controversial and some people may criticize him. But he's so absolutely upfront and he wears his heart on his sleeve about this. And this is what I mean by uh, the principles of UPF engaging on a higher level now, more than ever before. In the past, I, before this summit, I felt we had participants at summits, and these people were participating in a summit. But now I feel like they're really engaging with UPF, engaging with the principles and the practices of UPF in a, in a whole new way. Mike Pompeo is just one example of that that I could cite from the whole, whole event. So I think it, it bodes very well for the future. But there were others as well, so he's not the only one. Uh, because I think from a European perspective, the most important person, this is my final point, by the way, Margaret, because Margaret's worried I'm going on too long. Um, the the uh, importance of Boris Tadic is that he was, as I mentioned before, president of Serbia for eight years, from 2004 to 2012. But also he's a very unusual Serbian president because he espouses very profound principles mainly based, I have to say, on psychology, although partly on faith as well, about the need to take international relations to a new level. And what, what he means by that is that it's about engaging heart to heart between people. It's not about trading off, uh, I'll stop using those arms if you stop trading those arms with somebody else or whatever. It's not about that, it's about, it's about really engaging heart to heart between people and really engaging with not only my, my, the needs of my nation, but the needs of the other nation in a very profound way. Being genuinely concerned about the welfare of the other and not just about oneself and, well, whatever happens to the other person doesn't matter so much. So I think um, Boris Tadic is, is a, a very exceptional politician in anywhere, but especially in, in um, Serbia because not too many politicians have had his same kind of uh, heart as an approach to peace. So he basically said, and I, I, I was going to read you the whole of his testimony, because he wrote a page and a half testimony on, on uh, uh, letterhead of a former president of Serbia, but uh, that would take too long. But basically what he's saying is he feels that his whole life, uh, and I, he told me this when, I, he, when, I, when he first arrived at the, at the event, I sat down with him for 20 minutes or half an hour and talked, and he was so excited, like a, almost like a, a child, almost, in a, in a good way. And um, he really felt that he was coming to something special. And what, in his testament at the end, what he testifies to is essentially that he has found something that he's been looking for all of his life, a project that can help world peace to be established on a whole new level. And the whole new level is not to do with arms or to do with money or economics or whatever, but to do with the human heart. And he's a professor of psychology and you know, he, he's taught these kind of principles himself. So he was very, when he says he's grateful to Mother Moon uh, and Father Moon as well, of course, for their commitment 
because such a commitment is exactly what is needed at the global level as a driver of building a new system of values, a new kind of engaged work for peace building. That is what he feels he's found in UPF, and he's pledged to work with us closely. He wants to work with us on starting a, a center for peace in the Balkans. We didn't have time to tell him we already have one. We want to invite him there. But anyway, he is uh, an extremely important person for the future because we see the Balkans, Father and Mother Moon saw the Balkans as the key part of Europe because, uh, okay, the rest of the Europe is the EU and most Balkan nations want to be part of the EU, but actually the EU isn't living up to these principles. So the idea is to start a Balkan union of some kind between the various nations, which the uh, principles of UPF are very much front and foremost. And uh, Boris Tadic wants to work with us in that. So there again, you have another example of people not just participating, but people coming to engage, committing themselves and wanting to work with us in the future, and people of this very, very highest level in that part of Europe. So I think from that point of view, it was a very um, successful event, and I'm sure it's going to raise the next summit up to a whole new level still. We'll see even greater things there. So uh, please keep watching this space. Thank you. So one thing that UPF does and prides itself on is bringing people from all different perspectives together, creating forums by which uh, people can, can discuss, can dialogue, can get to understand each other's perspective. So uh, uh, one of the, the ways of, of creating the meeting between uh, former pre uh, President Kim Il-sung, the late President Kim Il-sung, and uh, Father and Mother Moon was uh, Antonio Betancourt, who is a, a former leader of, of UPF, going to uh, President uh, Carrasso of, of Costa Rica and getting him to approach uh, uh, Fidel Castro to send a letter to uh, President Kim Il-sung because it wasn't being dealt with on a, on a sufficient level uh, going to uh, different embassies. But because we could go to all kinds of, of leaders uh, to work, this was possible. So we're not just working with Republican right wing of, of uh, American politics, but we're also working with the Cambodian Prime Minister Hun Sen. And in, in the past, our successful out outreaches use both wings. I'd like to invite now um, Keith Bennett. Keith, I, I remember, correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember meeting in Chatham House many years ago. And uh, Keith was uh, quite, uh, I think, surprised to see me. And uh, I was very surprised to meet him because he, he knew who I was and knew the background. And then I, I got to find out that he came to love and respect Father Moon because of this, this visit to Penyang and these outreaches for peace. And there are, there are many stories behind there which we, uh, we can tell at another time. But I'd like to invite Mr. Keith Bennett to, to come and talk. <laughs> Keith was, or is the uh, Vice Chair of the Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il Foundation. Uh, someone who's been to North Korea 50 times. is part of the uh, 48 Club, which is called the Icebreakers, of the first people who would tra trade with uh, the People's Republic of China. If, correct me if I've got, got the titles wrong. Um, but we'd love to hear you speak again, Keith. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mark and uh, Robin and Margaret and everyone, Joyce, everyone here for, for your invitation. It's always a, a pleasure to, uh, to see you all. And uh, thank you 
Robin for that, if I may say, so very nice and, and gracious introduction. Um, thank you. And I'd like to really begin my remarks by expressing on this occasion my sympathies and my best wishes uh, to Mother Moon in particular, because irrespective of the broader and deeper things that, that Father Moon may have uh, meant to her and, and to, to the movement that he founded and to other people in, in this room, uh, Mother Moon not only lost that person, but she lost her lifelong companion and the mother of her children. And we must always remember that no matter how exalted um, anyone's position in life is, that th this is something that when it comes to any of us, uh, to have that kind of loss touches us uh, very deeply. And so I would like to very sincerely, um, once again on this occasion, offer my condolences in particular um, to, to Mother Moon on the very particular loss that, that she suffered 10 years ago, and which I don't doubt for one moment she continues to feel probably every day. I wanted to talk um, a little bit um, about um, uh, Father and Mother Moon's visit to, to Pyongyang over just over 30 years ago now, which has just as Robin has introduced and intimated, although my thunder has perhaps been a little bit stolen by having listened extensively to Mike Pompeo. I certainly don't, I certainly don't agree with everything that Mike Pompeo said, but um, it was certainly very interesting um, to, to hear what he had to say, and it's extremely important that, that a person, you know, with that, um, you know, with that uh, level and, and experience continues to be engaged in this process. Um, perhaps people uh, don't know, but before President Trump and uh, uh, Kim Jong-un met, uh, Mike Pompeo had made several visits to, to Pyongyang. Um, the, I think the light, latter one was, was, was public, um, but previously, as, as before he was Secretary of State, as head of the CIA, he'd also made, I think, at least two visits uh, to, to Pyongyang, which were private and secret at that time. But on all of those occasions, he uh, met and, and spoke with uh, Kim Jong-un and dined with him. So he brings, whether one agrees with him or not, um, he brings a great deal of experience and insight um, to, to this situation, which is very valuable um, to, uh, to, to have involved. And so just to, a little bit of my own you know, much more peripheral and, and insignificant um, insight into this. What I would like to say is that the division, the continued division of Korea after more than 70 uh, decades is the most significant or perhaps the only real unfinished business of World War II. Uh, and that's, you know, World War II is increasingly something that happened before any of us were born. Uh, so, you know, it is such a, a long-standing, you could say, scar and, and tragedy uh, on world politics. And because of this, I think that in a very real sense, one can say that the unification of Korea means the unification of the world, both because the part reflects the whole and, and because it embodies the, the, the continued division that, that, that exists, that if, if the Korean people can reunite, it means that no matter how difficult the fun, fundamental divisions dividing people uh, can be overcome, in my opinion anyway. And I think this is part of the huge significance of the visit that Father and Mother Moon made, as I said, and as we all know, just over a little more than 30 years ago. And that visit, again, as um, Mike Pompeo really, really made clear, that visit was something that caught the imagination of, of the world. And it certainly caught my imagination. Um, it wasn't, uh, it was, Pat, you know, this, this, re, this relationship now between the unification movement and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea is perhaps something that nowadays 
after three decades, people have sort of got used to, in a way. But it was to, you know, if you weren't following these things at the time, I can tell you it was really sensational. Um, and, you know, because, as, again, as we've heard, Father Moon, uh, you know, a lifelong uh, anti-communist, was reaching out to his old uh, adversary and was um, prepared to, to sit with him and to make peace, to find a way forward. And at that time, I, at the time of Father Moon's visit, I talked to um, North Korean diplomats in Paris about it. At that time, there was no uh, diplomatic representation of North Korea in this country. So if you had any dealings with them at all, it was through Paris. So I talked with um, uh, the um, diplomats in Paris, they're sort of saying, well, yeah, tell me what's going on here, please. And the reply, part of the reply I got was, was very interesting. And one of them said, well, we don't really know, but we think that as people get older, they tend to think more of their native place. That, that was one of the things um, that, uh, that, that was said. And I think that this, this feeling um, I don't discount it at all. This feeling is something that's also captured in a famous Korean song. Well, it's certainly famous in North Korea. I, I don't know if it's famous in South Korea, but there's a famous Korean song called Nostalgia in the original and literal meaning of that word, of, of longing for one's native place. And this is a song that, uh, that President Kim Il-sung himself uh, liked to sing. And now members of the unification movement, and again, Mike Pompeo reflected some of this, you know, often speak of Father and Mother Moon visiting Pyongyang at the risk of their lives. And considering the whole situation and the background and the history, it's a sentiment uh, and a view that I can perfectly well understand. But we also have a famous saying in English, and I'm, I'm sure it's a saying in other countries, other, maybe in other cultures as well, that it takes two to tango. And so I, you know, I believe that both Father Moon and President Kim Il-sung can be said to have displayed magnanimity and farsightedness in what, in what they did when they sat together, and also the belief that blood is indeed thicker than water, both for the Korean nation, but also for the wider human family as a whole. That what brings us, what it brings us together is far more important than other material things. And Father Moon and his followers, the members of his movement, have been very true and faithful to the promises that Father Moon made to Kim Il-sung when they, when they met in, at the end of 1991, faithful to the work of striving always for peace, of promoting international political engagement that's really a great theme of, um, of, of the footage that we've seen earlier this evening, both, both that which Mark showed and which was also shown at the beginning about the, the conference that, that took place in Seoul earlier this year. But also, for example, um, at the time of President Kim Il-sung's 80th birthday, which was in 1992, and Father Moon sent, well, he sent the... Um, delegation from the Washington Times who had the interview with, with uh, Kim Il-sung. He also sent a delegation from the Summit Council for World Peace, made up with um, people like a former, as I remember, former president of Costa Rica, former governor general of Canada. And they spoke with, with, um, with Kim Il-sung and talked about the things that they could, they could motivate their country to do to promote reconciliation, peace, and, and, uh, and development. And uh, so mentioning development, that's the other promise that uh, Father Moon and, and his movement have kept, that of extending economic cooperation to North Korea without any thought of, of, of gain or profit, but out of compatriotic feelings and human feelings. Um, and economic, uh, they've extended this economic cooperation in a whole number of areas, let's just say from, from hotel management to car manufacture, being two that I know about. But there's also been a sense of obligation from both sides that has continued um, since that um, epoch-making visit of December 1991. 
When President Kim Il-sung passed away in July 1994, Father Moon sent his emissary uh, to the funeral ceremony uh, for Kim Il-sung, even though the government in South Korea at that time uh, actually tried by all means to, um, to uh, prevent uh, people from the South from going to Pyongyang on that occasion. So yes, you can say that Father and Mother Moon went to Pyongyang at the risk of their lives, but his Father Moon's emissary went to Kim Il-sung's funeral at the risk of being imprisoned when he would return home to South Korea. So this is, this is very important, I think. Um, and we also know, and this, this continues, we know, um, I read in the um, Kyodo News Agency of Japan, that uh, the present leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-un, sent his own appreciation and sympathies to Mother Moon on this, um, on this 10th anniversary. And th these things are, I think, important because of the, the importance that Korean people attach to, to family and to that kind of uh, fidelity, but also because they represent in microcosm the kind of reconciliation of the heart and the mind that is needed uh, to, to overcome what can seem to be really intract intractable problems. So in a word, um, what I'd like to conclude by saying is that we can see from this whole history that the road to peace needs courage, it needs vision, it needs magnanimity, it needs forgive the ability to forgive on both sides, and it needs broad-mindedness. I believe that history will surely record Father Moon's contribution to peace, epitomized by this icebreaker visit, icebreaking visit to Pyongyang 30 years ago with great respect and honor. And those are the remarks I'd like to make. Thank you once again. It's always nice to be in Lancaster Gate. I'd like to invite uh, someone else who was at the, the summit in the middle of this last month. Uh, I'd like to invite the, uh, the president of the Family Federation for World Peace and Unification in Europe and the Middle East, uh, Dr. Michael Balcom, who we're very fortunate to have here today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Robin. <laughs> this always happens to me. I'm the last speaker before you get your dinner and you have a hungry look as well you should. So I promised Margaret I'd keep it to under an hour and a half, so you should be eating your cold pizza by nine o'clock. Actually, one of the lasting memories I have of Father Moon was a luncheon with him in about 2009. It was after a big conference similar to the one that Mark had uh, described, and we were all sitting ready to eat in a much bigger room than this, seated around these you can close your eyes and imagine it. Banquet tables with fresh white linen, 10 forks, 18 knives, you know, the full works. And the MC made the terrible mistake of asking Father Moon, would you like to say a few words before lunch? <laughs> oh my God. He spoke for five hours. And lunch became cold and gradually turned into dinner. And we, who were organizing it, were filled with embarrassment and mortification. And finally, at 7 o'clock, everyone ate in stony silence. And on the bus back to Korea, we almost did not dare to speak to people to ask. You can imagine yourself when you go home at 11 o'clock tonight, thinking you were finishing at 8, how you'll feel. <laughs> and no sooner had we arrived back at the hotel, now it's midnight. And we're just thinking, this is the most embarrassing day of our lives. A phone call comes from Father Moon. He says, you know what? I didn't finish what I had to say. Bring them back again tomorrow morning at 5 a.m. for a sunrise service. Oh my God. These are not members of our church or our movement, but nevertheless, it fell to me, among others, to go knocking on their door at 3 a.m. Excuse me, Mr. President, but uh, would you come for 5 o'clock morning service? Father Moon wants to tell you something more. And amazingly, eight out of 10 of them came. So at 5 a.m. we're gathered in the morning, hungry, tired, still smarting from the indignity of the day before. One think, what could he possibly have to say that calls us all here? And five o'clock came, 
and then six o'clock, and then seven o'clock, and at eight o'clock we had to admit he's not coming. And uh, sorry, there's no breakfast either, but have a nice day. And they all left. And the next morning, we had a third meeting. This was just Father Moon with the core staff. And he said, does anyone have any questions? I, I couldn't help myself. I said, yeah, yeah, I have a question. What the hell are you doing treating our best VIPs like this? He said, listen to me. Those people, they go to dinners and lunches all the time. They even eat the same food. It's always chicken. They will forget any words that were said. I wanted them to remember that day for the rest of their lives. And I thought, yeah, you sure did that all right. But you know what? Three years later, when Father Moon passed and we had the ceremony in Korea, many of those same people came to pay their respects. And at dinner that evening, which we started on time, as we will hear, quite many of them shared how that experience had bonded them in some way. They were like survivors of the great lengthy lunch and the breakfast meeting that never happened. So tonight, no, I'm not gonna do that to you. <laughs> tonight you will dine. Thank you so much for coming to offer your respects to a man that, and a woman that I love and have respected all my life. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Hello, how are you? <laughs> Quite a lot of uh, talks, but I like Mike because he is exciting, short, to the point, and tells you strange things as well. <laughs> uh, what I wanted to say now is anyone who has, I don't know, I can't, I can't see it. Anyone who has a comment to make, or a question to ask, or to say something, particularly if they, they know Father Moon. But it has to be only one minute. <laughs> yes, because you know, as many of you as possible can, can say, because we are very democratic <laughs> and want very much people to, to do what they want. But there is our, our um, a chair of our trustees, Keith Best, do you want to say something? <laughs> well, not really. I certainly don't have the intellectual authority or the knowledge of the very eminent speeches we just heard. I think we will probably, even if we uh, have, have known of Father Moon and Dr. Jahan Moon uh, very well. We've all learnt something uh, this afternoon, which is fascinating because it's an, it's an evolving story. For me, Father Moon, and I did have the privilege of, of, of meeting him, albeit very, very briefly, but for me, he encapsulates two things. The first is a simple message and perseverance of never letting go of the dream, of the idea. And it reminds me of um, those, those words of uh, the cultural anthropologist who was posthumously given the Congressional Medal of Honor, um, Margaret Mead, and you will know this quote almost by hand, never doubt that a small group of committed <laughs> citizens can change the world because, it, and I'm paraphrasing, nothing else really has. And Father Moon encapsulates that concept. You don't have to be numerous. You have to be committed you have to be somebody who others hold in respect for what they do, and therefore join that movement because of those, those reasons. And, and Father Moon encapsulates that. And I think the, the other thing for me that really comes across is the message. And you know, I think Keith, Keith's um, political views and mine are probably don't coincide. <laughs> uh, a great deal, and uh, he very generously didn't go for Mike Pompeo's throat, but clearly there is a frisson there as to that. But when you come to the concept of the unification of a people, when you come to the concept of being guided by the Spirit of God, that transcends those political barriers. 
And what I find fascinating about UPF is that you will find, no doubt, sitting in this room, apart from a much wider audience, those who have hold diametrically opposed political views, but yet come together in the pursuance of that dream. That is the most incredible thing when you think about it, to be able to bring together people in that way. And that surely must be a lasting and that's legacy. That's the best thing. I, I'm very proud to be with UPF, and I'm very proud of you people. This room full of people, that you're just so special to us because of what Keith was saying. It doesn't matter what person you are, what country, what political um, persuasion. But what's important is we want to be together to build a better world. And that's what UPF wants to do, to bring people together all the time. So, uh, anybody else? Where's, where's the microphone? Uh, Sheikh first, please. <laughs> short. Short, very short. God bless you all. God bless you all. Of course, it's Margaret. That's, that's, that's a lovely lady of which I, I, I love, like, really. I, I my like. sister. My sister. Put your hand together for, for Margaret. I love to put hands. People. Absolutely, absolutely. Of course, the half a minute is gone. God bless you all. I greet you with the Islamic greeting of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. May peace and blessing of Almighty God be upon you all. What I would like to say, of course, about the Father and the Mother Moon, which I met them, of course, a couple of times I met Father Moon when he was alive. God bless you. Uh, his soul, he's a very holy man. And, and, and uh, uh, Mother Moon, many occasions, we, we, we came in a big summit together, standing together with the many others. However, I totally respect their way which they done, especially the Father Moon. What brought me here, it was a Father Moon's way which he works. He knocked, he said, knocked all the doors, one by one. Day and night knocked the doors. Many shut the doors and many opened the doors to him. And he never give up. Never give up for the sake of peace. That was his job, sake of peace. And he left a legacy. I'm finishing it now, of course. He left a legacy, very important legacy, okay? To do it and bring, it, bring of course, South and North and South together and the whole world together by the grace of God. He left a legacy he couldn't finish. We finish it for him. Yeah. God bless you all. God bless you. So that's great. Um, Ahlam, Ahlam, do you want to say something? Short. <laughs> Can you give a microphone, please? No, no, no. It's good to, to have a microphone. Ahla Makram is a good friend for many years, and she and she's working for women's emancipation <laughs> and empowerment. I can't hear. Put it closer to you. Well, my experience with this group, whom really uh, is, a, is a unique one, because at the beginning, I didn't believe in what they were doing, though they were the first people who came to support my call for peace when I was active in the Arab-Israeli conflict. With time, yes, they're lovely, but probably they are a bit naive. <laughs> and then I left, I got busy with other things. I stopped the Arab-Israeli conflict because it disheartened me at the end. I worked with Jewish organization, mind you. I didn't work with Arabic or Palestinian organizations. I worked with like-minded people believe in humanity. And then anyway, I traveled, I, I don't know what, and I forgot all about them until I met Robin in a, in a reception, and my gosh, I remembered, and perhaps the age as well added to it, that I realized these people are serious and they, were, they are keen on peace. But, and and they, are, they, they adopt everybody, as long as you are doing the right thing for everybody's benefit, for humanity. And they, in fact, I came back by myself and they adopted me because for <laughs> me, for me, we, we all long for peace, but peace would not come without justice and equality within our own communities and societies. And that justice and equality, firstly and above all, has to start by gender equality. 
I respect all religions, I respect everything, but at the same time, I think that we are living in a world that should be governed by our common humanity if we want to carry on. If we want to carry the, the message for peace, it has to be peace within ourselves, within our heart, to, to humanize each other exactly. above all and first of all. And that's why I initiated Basira for universal women's rights, which falls in the heart of what you are doing. And again, Margaret and Robin, thank you so much. They readopted me and opened the doors. And thank you so much. Thank you for listening and thank you for coming. Can you give to Fotini, please, here? This lady here? Oh, yes. Why not? Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for this amazing meeting. I just very quickly would like to express uh, maybe my personal view on that. So, um, Father Moon, it's a great man who tried to create one unity, one nation, because we all created actually from the one creator, one DNA at the beginning. So, uh, to be a oneness, to be a togetherness, because it's mentioned togetherness, there are two, four columns one column is love, another is peace, another collaboration, which exactly Father Monkey tried to do it, collaboration and peace. And another is religion. We talk here about freedom and religious, we talk about communism. And uh, what I can see, I lived, uh, I, lived uh, uh, I started my life 20 years in communistic regime in Russia, in the middle of Russia. And also then in Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian religion, five years. In Greece, 18 years. In Greek Orthodox religion. Then in Belgium, another five years. Catholic religion. Then now in United Kingdom, Protestant religion. So what I saw, when we have thousands of religions, we cannot be oneness. We never can be oneness. <laughs> That's why I believe that all religious leaders must reconsider their target. The target should be to reconnect all us, exactly. all people, to the one creator who created our DNA, who created our body, who created the nature, who created the universe. He is one, independently how we can call him in different languages. I know five languages, we can, I can name him differently. It doesn't matter. So the, if we all, not we, but all religious leaders will be unified, people with the one creator, then we'll have one, one, one religious. And when we'll have one religious, we have one love, one peace, one collaboration, one religious. Amen. Then we'll Amen. be one unity. Amen. Then we'll Amen. be one nation. And Amen. Amen. One nation. Thank you. Uh, just give it to that gentleman. Uh, I, I agree that uh, I, I think Father Moon would have been very happy to hear that. His last words were uh, like more like, you know, the last stage of people coming together is when religions and religious leaders realize they are one and work together. It's impossible that we can do alone. We have to work together. So that's very good. Thank you, Fotini. Anybody else? Uh, Would you like just to have a quick uh, word? Short, on? short, short, and not uh, advertisement. <laughs> good evening, everybody. I would like just to uh, tell you why this is so important. This is the Times Education Commission, and the reason for it was a report on child suicide in London knifings, and my book, which I got on Boris's desk the day he took office. And the one section of world society that has been almost totally forgotten is the children. And the scale of the damage is incalculable. For example, Prime Minister Brown said that we've lost a whole generation. This is why this report is so important. The Times Education, you can phone them and ask for a copy. All the Prime Ministers, all the education, leading educationists have worked on this. And the answer is that it's holistic education, which is exactly what my book, From Heaven to Heaven, was saying, which I had given to Sir Anthony Selden, uh, because I told him the state of the schools, because I was in 80 schools. But what really formed me was seven years at Centerpoint, listening to what the children were telling me about the brokenness of society. It was horrendous. So all I ask you to do read this. And the United Nations is back in holistic education. And in every country in the world now, over Zoom, I've been proclaiming that there should be a community creativity center in every town and village so that every child 
has a holistic education. Wonderful. Musical instrument. Thank you. Um, no, I, I, I want to, sorry, this gentleman talked to me first. His name is His Excellency Winston Mackenzie. Yes? Doctor, is it? Doctor? Yes. Yeah. Welcome. <laughs> hey, good evening, everybody. I'd just like to say a big thank you to, uh, was it Margaret, Marianne? I, 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 Margaret. I would, well, I was, Margaret uh, Robin. Okay, I was um, invited here this evening, fresh out of hospital, having two, a knee operation, ah. limping around the park, and I saw this amazing lady. And Marianne, my um, business manager and friend, said, we need to, let's have a word with this lady. I said, oh, come on, I'm fed up, I ain't got no time. I was fascinated, and I've arrived here this evening fascinated, astounded. I'm a peace ambassador for the United Nations. Wow. And this group, this godly group, is amazing for me. It's just amazing. <laughs> um, the United Nations chaplain um, heralded me, brought me in, and the backing, the potential to help other groups, the financial backing and the entrepreneurs that I have behind me now, we are now running a huge, um, a huge agenda in, in um, Nigeria wow. and Uganda and Ghana to, to um, supply them with holistic, 100% holistic fertilizer. Africa needs to grow its own products mm. and sell and ship them out well done. and be responsible for the upbringing of the youth. Get the youth on board and rejuvenate a country that has so much to offer the world. And that's my job. That's what I'm all about. You're very welcome. Thank you so much. And hopefully you will be ambassador for peace Absolutely. of UPF. Absolutely. Welcome, welcome. Um, okay, it has to be short because we have another meeting, by the way. Those who want to stay for the other meeting must put their hands up in a minute. Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am very happy here today to see you healthy after the COVID. And uh, I'm very happy to see you again. I have short message in this important day from Father Moon. Today is 13 August. It's very important a day in the Iraq, in the Middle East, to back dictatorial regime again to Iraq because they don't accept democracy and federalism. It is very dangerous for my nation, for the Kurdish people, because what we were in divided between Iraq, Iran, Turkey, Syria. They are all of them dictatorial regimes. They don't accept democracies. And we are waiting the civil war and uh, again genocide. Five years ago, we asked a referendum for uh, decision about our situation, but they don't accept it. Now, in the very dangerous in the situation in the Middle East. Thank you very you know, much. We are, we are friends. We are friends in, in uh, trying to um, stop genocide. Yes. Uh, Kurdish and Armenian. Yeah, yeah. So that's why, that's why, you know. We are I very afraid no. from genocide again. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank so you very much. Uh, I think, I think we, very soon we have to finish because we have another event at quarter to eight. Yes, yes, I know. <laughs> we have a, a special, a special person here from the past. Ahmed. 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 Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I just wanted to say um, a very brief message. Uh, I have been uh, a member of the United UPF. UPF, Universal Peace Federation, for over 25 years. Marshall. I am honored that uh, Mrs. Margaret and Mr. Robin have awarded me an ambassador, peace ambassador. Um, as a Libyan, as the president of the Democratic Party of Libya, which is the first political party to emerge after the end of dictatorship, I had access to this opulent conference room. The launch uh, event of the Democratic Party occurred in this room 12 years ago, on the 17th of February 2011. Awesome. And 
uh, I am honored to say I have been accepted twice uh, to a conference in South Korea. Um, uh, and uh, I am very grateful for Univer Universal Peace Foundation for sponsoring this uh, uh, scholarship twice. And in all the years that I have been a member, no one ever, ever has tried to convert me to Christianity. No, of course not. no one ever has tried to coerce me to change my religion. I am a Muslim. I am affiliated to a Sunni family, but I feel I have graduated to some kind of uh, uh, a new age school called uh, Sufism. And I always follow the motto that UPF promote, which is we are one human family under the Lord. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> okay. Thank okay, you. we only uh, we just, only have just, just please minute. come. I just like to say okay. What's your name now? Asa. 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 Asa Emmanuel, yes. Hello everyone. Hello. I'm a guy and you sound a bit loud. I would just like to say thank you very much to Sister Suda, Joy Suda, to invite me. Yay, thank you, Suda. I'm a visiting member since they had the one in Arrow. Sister Gwyneth, the late Sister Gwyneth, and her husband used to come in shop yes, to take me. Yes. 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 So I'm a visiting member, and I must say, everyone is so welcoming. And tonight, I'm, I should say, we have some very excellent speakers. And thank you to everyone. Have a peaceful evening and a blessed night. Oh, thank you I like that, nice and short. Oh, yes, sorry. Sorry, my, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Shahi. OK. Short. Partner. Good evening. It's going to be very short. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, first of all, I am very grateful, Margaret, Robin, who invited me for this uh, very wonderful event, and for all the speakers who give us a very great insight of the uh, Father Moon and for all his working and everything as well. So I'm grateful for all of these things. I only wanted to make up one last appeal. As you already aware, all of you, Pakistan is flooded know, at the moment. Yes. Nearly 65% of the population is under the water. People have no food, yeah. no house, no way to live at the moment. I'm not here to ask money, but whatever you can donate, whatever you can spare, there's lots and lots of organizations who are working online. You can donate them and everything as well. Even two pounds can provide a meal to a one person as well. So I would be very grateful if anybody can contribute to us. Thank I, you very I much. Have a, I have a, uh, some statement to make about that. Uh, Robin was talking to someone who wants to make fundraising, and if you people, I trust you, and yeah. fundraiser of uh, 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 Mr. Uh, Sheikh, Sheikh also is a good fundraiser, yeah. and you yeah. come together and we yeah, can yeah. do fundraising That's here. So a couple of weeks ago, we did a fundraising event in Hamel Hempstead, and we have generated around 6,200 pounds uh, with the help of local community as well. And uh, I am going there next month as well. So every after two weeks, we are sending one person there, and we are distributing by ourselves That's very good and idea. approaching local people. So we're not using any NGO, any organization. Yeah. As you all understand, they are already have a lot of overheads. So yeah. money which we send them already contribute towards the expenses, yeah. staff wages, and yeah. everything as well. But we've got so, we've got a good also yeah. friends in in the Pakistani the community. Is there, Muslim Muslim Muslims are here yeah, as well. yeah doing as well. Uh, just, just briefly, if you yeah. are with us, then, then we yeah. can help. That's very, very average, actually. Bismillah ar rahim in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Morrissey, grateful. First of all, very, very nice of you to give me a chance. It's so nice of you to bring all the people together for this particular session. And we must pay the tribute to the founder of this uh, wonderful UPF organization, which is world famous. And we are all proud to be the ambassador of this organization. And we are here to pay the tribute to the founder and his wife. Uh, secondly, as the gentleman has already said, Pakistan is submerged with the water. It's a very serious flood. Uh, you could say you can go back about 30, 40 years. The country has never seen the flood of that nature. And most of the organization are doing their bit as much as they can, so much so that the head of the state had to go internationally and to ask for the aid because it's very difficult for the country to cope with the disaster. It's of the highest scale. Margaret has already a very soft heart while I was talking to her. I'm proud to be a member of the UPF, although I have been working with the great NGOs, Muslim Aid, and we are dealing with the natural disaster and calamities over the period of 37 years. It's a great organization founded by Katz Freeman, 
known as previously known as Cat Steven, but then he changed his name and he became a Muslim, yes. and his name is Yusuf Islam. Islam. Alhamdulillah, this organization was founded by him. As uh, Sheikh has part, Sheikh is part of it, and another suggestion has come to you uh, by Abdul. He, Abdul has discussed the matter with uh, Robin Marsh, and I think he is requesting you to give us a chance uh, to come on the platform sure. and to request. We will be sure. very grateful for that. Yeah. It's a national disaster, yeah. and we all have to chip in as much as we can. We, we, uh, have, we have this place at your disposal if, if it's free. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, we, and we are part and parcel of it, and, and this organization, I'm proud for it, although I have been working with the NGOs on the international scale, but I'm proud to be a part of it, as uh, Margaret and Robin will know, that uh, this organization brings the people of different backgrounds together under one roof. And yeah. this is how I was fascinated, and I'm glad that I'm a part of this. Thank you for listening, Shukran. but we'll, we'll be coming to see you later. Bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I will be coming as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, then we can have a meeting on that. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, we have about two minutes, last, last person. And, okay, our pastor, wow, Isaac, please. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. I'm really happy to be here this evening again. I want to appreciate God for bringing people together this way, under one roof, through the inspiration and the mission of Father Moon. Some of, some of my friends and uh, brothers and sisters here have said, made a statement, and that statement is what made me to come out. The fact that you are part of UPF, no one has converted you from your religion. I think if I have any Christian brother here, let us take something home. Every man that you see on the surface of the heart today are created by God, and God loved them. And that's why the scripture tells me, my father-in-law is a Muslim. My wife is a Muslim. But by the time I will marry her, she became a Christian. So we've been together for 27 years with three children. The faith that she has, the faith that I have, has not touched us. Of course, she's been converted to Christian. Because the Bible says, John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the whole world, the whole world. And he said, whosoever believeth in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. If God loved the whole world, he loved the Muslim, he loved the Hare Krishna, he loved the Hindus, he loved all those religions that we see. So let's open our heart, let's embrace every other faith. Amen. It shall be well with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank, you. thank you, thank you very much. I'm very sorry now. The reason is, now we have to enter another meeting. Now, those who are staying for the meeting, uh, of uh, ID, uh, I mean, voter ID, uh, can stay here. Those who want to go home, they can go downstairs to have their, their, their refreshments. Who's going to stay here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. Oh, um, can, can you count from after Mike? Yeah. 18. Uh, we'll, we'll finish at, we'll have pizza first, only for those who are staying. <laughs> and then after that, we'll have, to, we'll have to have one hour, 15 minutes to eat, etc. And then we'll have to take these chairs out and put tables for a hackathon. It's a very interesting way to find out the, the input of every single person that's here, that wants to be in the meeting. You're, you're, not, you're not going. Look, he doesn't want to stay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Excuse me. Actually, we have some, some new friends here, some new, new guests. 
Um, and we're very grateful, but actually we don't know you so well. So Dr. Uh, Ambassador uh, Mackenzie, so please, please come up and introduce yourself. And, and, uh, but you have to be quite short. Excuse me, those who are leaving who's leaving now, Ladies and gentlemen, um, as I said um, a short while ago previously, my name is Dr. Winston McKenzie. I am a United Nations Peace Ambassador. This is my first visit to this amazing meeting. Um, the United States, United Nations ambassadorial role has been in action now for just over a year. And I feel that having met you wonderful people this evening, in Jesus' name, I can bring so much to the table. I want to get around, get to know as many people as I can. And it's all about working together. I love your education agenda. Fantastic. We have to educate the people of Africa, the young people of Africa, because in this country, it's the youngsters have been forgotten. There are multiple stabbings yesterday at, um, at Notting Hill Carnival. And I believe if groups and associations like this can pull together, regardless of um, religious um, uh, affiliation, regardless of political affiliation, come together, pull together as a people and make this thing work. We are headed towards absolute pandemonium and it's groups like these that can save the world. Thank you for your time, and I hope I get to know you all and um, visit on a regular basis. Thank you so much, Margaret. And thank you to Tina. Who, she's not, I don't know if she's... she's thank you one. so much. She was the one. You're a blessing. Thank you. We met in the park. Thank you. 